camera. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's streaming only History is Lunch program. We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Please tune in for another streaming only History is Lunch next week when author Deanne Stevens will discuss her book on the 1878 yellow fever epidemic in Mississippi. It could hardly be more topical. Today, we are delighted to welcome Robert P. Jones to discuss the legacy of white supremacy in U.S. Christianity. Jones is a Jackson native who holds a B.S. in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College, a Master's of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a Ph.D. in religion from Emory University. He is the founder and CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute, and his book, The End of White Christian America, won the 2019 Grawmeyer Award in Religion. His new book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, was published last week. We're pleased to also have with us the Reverend Dr. K. Jason Coker. After nearly two decades in Connecticut, Coker returned to his home state to work for peace and justice in areas of persistent rural poverty. He is the National Director of Together for Hope, the Rural Development Coalition of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and he serves as field coordinator for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of Mississippi. We are trying a new thing today. Robbie Jones joins us live on screen from Washington, D.C. via Zoom. We'll hear first from Jason Coker, then go to Robbie, who will say a few words about the video presentation he has recorded for us today. After we watch that video, Jason and Robbie will have a conversation. Then we'll close with questions from the viewing audience. You can type those at any time in the live stream chat. Now here's Jason Coker. Thank you, Chris. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, to introduce Robert P. Jones, uh, or Robbie Jones. I, I met Robbie at a very typical Mississippi setting at a backyard bir uh, birthday party uh, with barbecue. And I didn't know who he was until I met him there uh, when he was working. Uh, he had just finished his first book, uh, The End of White Christian America. So it is a real pr privilege to, to introduce him and uh, share in his anti-racist work in, in, the, in his academic life. With White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, uh, Jones draws on history, public opinion surveys, and personal experience to de deliver a groundbreaking analysis of the repressed history of the symbolic relationship between Christianity and white superiority. Uh, and as the nation grapples with the legacy of racism and white superiority, Jones argues that Christianity's role as a cornerstone of white supremacy has largely been overlooked. Uh, but white Christians, and from evangelicals in the South to mainline Protestants in the Midwest and Catholics in the Northeast, uh, white Christians haven't just been complicit or complacent. Rather, uh, Jones argues in this book that as the dominant cultural power, they constructed and sustained a project of protecting white superiority and opposing black equality that's framed the entire American story. And using case studies, qualitative data, historical analysis, and the author's own experience growing up in a white evangelical church here in Mississippi, and as his time as a student at Southern Baptist Seminary, White Too Long reveals unsettling truths about what white Christians actually believe, what motivates their behavior, and what constitutes the core of their identity. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. I look forward to, to our dialogue, uh, but I'll uh, end here. Jones concludes that, contem that contemporary white Christians must confront these bitter truths because this is the only way to salvage the integrity of their faith and their own identities. Jones challenges white Christians to acknowledge that public apologies are not enough. Accepting responsibility for the past requires work toward repair in the present. He illuminates a path forward, providing examples of congregations that are actively working to rebuild and build relationships and trust across lines of race. Communities who are courageously doing this hard work have discovered that the, a road to healing and reconciliation does exist, 
But to reach his destination, Jones argues that white Christians must be willing to walk through the valley of justice. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert P. Jones. Thanks, Jason, for that generous um, introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, Chris Goodwin and Brother Rogers uh, for hosting uh, the event today. Um, and I should say, uh, just in setting up the video, um, you know, I, I talk about uh, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum um, in the book, uh, which was a very moving um, experience for me that, that I must admit I, I came to uh, not really knowing uh, exactly what I what I would find um, uh, there when when the museum opened. I, I visited not long after it opened, but but I, I was deeply moved, uh, you know, not not just by kind of the expected you know pieces that you might you might see, but I think also uh, by the honesty I think of of the exhibits um, there and and uh, and I write about that again in the in the book and in particular um, the honesty about um, the the role that white uh, Christian churches um, in Mississippi played in resisting. Of the civil rights movement. I think the narrative, if you, if you use the words church and civil rights, uh, the immediate thing that people think about uh, are, of course, the African-American churches um, that were uh, these kind of hubs of um, organizing uh, and, and uh, advocating for civil rights for, for African-Americans. Uh, but I, I do think a story that's gotten very short shrift um, because it's, it's something of a, a painful one or a bitter one uh, is the role that, that white Christian churches played um, as really linchpins of the massive resistance uh, to, to civil rights um, uh, in, in the country. Uh, so as, as Jason said, I, I grew up, you know, uh, here, uh, there, here, um, where I am virtually in Jackson, Mississippi, um, grew up going to um, a, a church on the southwest uh, side of, of Jackson, um, and then uh, went to public school at Forest Hill High School, um, then to Mississippi College and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, so, you know, this, this, uh, my day job, I, I uh, have, wear a social science hat. And so the book has uh, a lot of current public opinion data in it um, to kind of analyze where the current attitudes of, of white, my fellow white Christians are today on, on these issues. Um, but it's, it is also kind of a memoir um, uh, and a, a story of my own faith journey wrestling with this difficult um, history that I, I came to um, embarrassingly so late in my um, in my adult life. So in some ways, it's a chronicling of that, that journey of um, awareness um, on my own part. Um, and so um, just to set up the video here, it, it, the, the presentation that you'll see, um, not from my square box that I'm in right now, but uh, uh, from a pre-recorded um, uh, lecture where I'm really talking about the Jackson Church Visit Campaign, which is what is depicted actually there at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Um, and, uh, and, and this campaign really uh, was about integrating um, white Christian churches um, as a strategic way and as something that was led by Medgar Evers and in fact was the last um, kind of public event uh, that he helped organize before um, he, he was murdered. So um, that's basically the, the, the setup for the video. And then um, I'll come back um, after the video and Jason and I will sit down and have a conversation and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Good afternoon. So happy to be joining everyone, at least virtually, uh, here for uh, this presentation. Uh, it's based on my new book uh, called White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And I want to talk today, focus here, about our neglected topic, and that is the role that white Christian churches played in supporting white supremacy during the civil rights movement uh, in the 1960s and the legacy of that role for today. This intimate dance between white churches, culture, and politics, and perhaps more importantly, the personal connections uh, between white pastors, civic leaders, the media, and elected officials was a familiar pattern across the South. While the critical role that black churches have played um, in organizing African Americans during the civil rights movement has rightly received um, a lot of attention uh, in, uh, among scholars, among the public, um, nevertheless, too little attention has been played to the role that white Christian churches played in resisting this work and upholding a close, a closed society that one ba based on and, uh, and dedicated to upholding the values of white supremacy. Um, I want to express my gratitude to Brother Rogers and Chris Goodwin at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History and to the museum itself, which accurately depicts this neglected story. 
Um, I should also say uh, I am uh, from Jackson, Mississippi. I'm a product of the Jackson Public School uh, System. I attended Oak Forest Elementary School, Sowell uh, Junior High School, and Forest Hill High School in the Jackson Public Schools. And I also went to Mississippi College. Uh, so I grew up my whole life in Jackson. Uh, so this story is uh, not only um, of interest to me as a scholar, uh, but also is, is very personal uh, to me as well. So I want to focus on stories of resistance, really, in Jackson's white Christian churches uh, to the civil rights movement and really focus on two prominent uh, churches and their role here. That is uh, the First Baptist Church of Jackson and Galloway Memorial United Methodist Church, um, and particularly their roles uh, during the what became called the Church Visit Campaign um, in 1963, which was an attempt uh, led by Medgar Evers uh, and others to integrate uh, Mississippi's churches in the early 1960s. Uh, so I'll start with and spend a little more time actually on uh, Jackson's influential First Baptist Church. Um, it was undoubtedly the most powerful religious institution in the state during those civil rights years. Years um, It was sometimes referred to as uh, Jackson's Tammany Hall, um, you know, a place where political influence and religious piety, social engineering and discipleship White supremacy in Sunday school mixed fairly easily. It was situated essentially across the street from the state capitol building, and it was the largest uh, denomination, uh, the largest church of any denomination in the state. Um, at the time, it had an 1,800-person per sanctuary that was filled to capacity on Sunday mornings, seven assembly, hall, seven, seven assembly halls um, that housed a variety of programs, and a Sunday school program that enrolled 2,200 children and adults. Um, its impressive facilities were a, really a fitting symbol of its powerful membership. It was the home of the powerful Hederman family, who controlled the Clarion Ledger and the Jackson Daily News, the largest newspapers in the state, along with the Jackson uh, television station WJTV and the South Mississippi Hattiesburg American. Multiple generations of the Hedermans uh, served as deacons in the church, wielded influences as the church's most generous patrons, and strongly shaped the church's stances on race issues. First Baptist also counted among his prominent members, um, Governor Ross Barnett, who served as a deacon and is the longstanding uh, superintendent of, of the men's, or su sorry, su serves as the deacon and the longstanding teacher of the men's Sunday school there. And SBC, FBC touted as a member, Lewis Hollis, the executive director of the Jackson Citizens Council, who also served as a superintendent of their extensive Sunday school program. So the church served as a religious and cultural hub for these men and for these other outside organizations um, that they represented. In the 1950s and 60s, uh, I should say the Hederman brothers were some of the most uh, pro prominent and powerful segregationist forces in the South. Um, just to give you two examples here of the influence uh, and the way that the reporting went uh, here uh, that was regularly generated for the Mississippi public. When, when the Supreme Court ruled uh, that the all-white University of Mississippi had to admit James Meredith uh, in 1962, the Jackson Daily News included a front page story featuring a picture of a cross that had been burned outside of Meredith's assigned student housing with the headline, quote, greeting for Negro. Similarly, the Clarion Ledger's coverage of Reverend Dar Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, 1963 March on Rock, Washington ran under the headline, quote, Washington is clean again with Negro trash removed, end quote, featuring a photo of the National Mall littered with garbage. Uh, 1967 National Review of Newspaper Coverage of the Civil Rights Movement by the Columbia Journalism Review dubbed the Clarion Ledger and the Jackson Daily News, quote, quite possibly the worst metropolitan papers in the United States. With the strong backing of the Hederman family, Barnett rose to become the most powerful politician in Mississippi during the Civil Rights Movement. He won the race for governor by running an overtly segregationist campaign where he appealed to religious conservatives by baptizing his white supremacist policies in Christian theology with claims like these, quote, God was the original segregationist, and quote, the Negro is different because God made him different to punish him. In addition to financing the, uh, the positive media coverage from the Hedermans, uh, Barnett received religious legitimization from the church. On the evening before his gubernatorial inauguration in 1960, for example, Reverend Dr. Douglas Hudgens, the pastor of First Baptist Church, conducted a Christian consecration service for Barnett, presenting him with an ornate public pulpit Bible and a special ceremony in the sanctuary. 
Barnett used Meredith's arrival at Ole Miss as a high-profile opportunity to make good on his campaign promise to prevent integration in Mississippi schools. In a widely covered speech, including front-page coverage at the Hederman-owned newspapers, Barnett opened with this sweeping assertion, quote, there is no case in history where the Caucasian race has survived social integration. Drawing on racist hyper hyperbole that would have been familiar to the white citizens of Mississippi, he defiantly declared, quote, we will not drink from the cup of genocide. The next day, the Jackson Daily News headline read, Mississippi Rick Mix, Ross says never. Just in case there was any confusion, the editorial page flatly concluded, we support government, Governor Barnett. Reverend Hudgens, the state's most prominent pastor in the civil rights era, filled the FBC pulpit from 1946 to 1969. Hudgens cast a long shadow in both religious and civic spaces. His sermons were a weekly dose of theology carefully curated to leave white supremacy undisturbed. Uh, they were not only heard by the influential citizens sitting in the pews, but also recorded and syndicated around the state via local radio. Hudgens also held leadership positions in a number of other civic groups. During his more than uh, two decade tenure as pastor, he served as director of the Jackson Chamber of Commerce, president of the Jackson Rotary Club, chaplain of the Mississippi Highway Safety Patrol, and a prominent member of the Masonic Order. For more than two decades, as the temperature climbed in Mississippi race relations, Reverend Hudgens built brick by brick a theological bulwark of personal and individual salvation designed to protect white Christian power and white Christian consciences from black demands for justice. When the U.S. Supreme Court handed down the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, the Southern Baptist Convention leadership surprisingly affirmed the decision, not only as a pragmatic matter of legal concession, but it consistent with Christian principles, angering many local churches. Here, the SBC exhibited a trait that existed in virtually all white Christian denominations. A small group in the national leadership was considerably ahead of the regional and local church leadership. Reverend Hudgens, like many other local clergy, voiced his strong opposition to the denomination's position, both at the national convention and at home. Then the Hedermans went to work in the press. In addition to the prominent coverage of Hudgens' statements opposing Brown v. Board of Education, the Jackson Daily News carried a front page story with extensive quotes from a number of deacons at First Baptist Church and included an editorial calling the SBC's af affirmation of Brown, quote, a deplorable action. One of the most blatantly white supremacist statements came from FBC deacon and assistant to the state attorney general, Alex McCaney. McCaney asserted that, quote, the facts of history make it plain that the development of civilization and of Christianity itself has rested in the hands of the white race, unquote, and declared the integration of any kind would ultimately result in racial intermarriage, quote, a course of which if followed to its end will result in driving the white race from the earth forever, never to return, end quote. On the editorial page of the same issue, the paper reassured its readers that Jackson's Baptist clergy and lay leaders were aligned in opposition to Brown and would ensure that nothing would, quote, change the complexion of Baptist congregations in the city, end quote. FBC itself maintained its, public, its official policy, barring attendance by non-whites, well past Hudgens' tenure, only repealing it in 1973. Underlying this interplay of religious, civic, and political activity was the core claim of Hudgens' theological worldview, that the cross of Christ had nothing to do with the social and political upheavals outside the walls of the church. Noted historian Charles Marsh, who dubbed Hudgens, quote, the theologian of the closed society, end quote, summarized Hudgens' theology this way, quote, had he stated the matter more explicitly, he might have said that the cross has nothing to do with the civil rights of black Mississippians. On the other hand, the cross ought to inspire uh, decent white people towards the preservation of the purity of the social body, and it certainly did, end quote. So in the 1950s and 60s, First Baptist Church was a vortex of mutually reinforcing religious, social, and political influence. So spelling this out, the Hedermans found in Ross Barnett their political champion of segregation and in Reverend Douglas Hudgens, a theologian whose dignified, approving presence legitimized their power and whose sermons soothed the white consciences against the mounting calls for justice outside the walls of the church. Governor Barnett, found in the Hedermans, patrons who had nearly bottomless pockets and a media machine that lavished public praise and attention to his political life, and in Reverend Hudgens, a pastor who, whose approving presence 
signals a divine blessing on his plans and on his character. And Reverend Hudgens found the church coffers full and his reputation burnished by being the pastor to such powerful men while enjoying positive and abundant personal media coverage himself. The Jackson Daily News, for example, offered the following lavish praise about Hudgens to their readers. Quote, few among our theological leadership equal in power, equal his power in exposition and amplification of the gospel message, end quote. So this collusion by the media, politicians, and religious leaders produced a nearly impenetrable force. Both white evangelical and mainline Protestant churches served as cultural hubs and moral legitimizers of white supremacy, while the power of the state protected their segregated sanctuaries. And these connections weren't confined to the Baptists, uh, unless everyone think I'm just picking on the Baptists, which by the way is my home uh, denomination, or even evangelical denominations. Uh, just a block away, uh, Galloway Memorial Methodist Church, a prominent congregation uh, in the mainline uh, Protestant uh, denomination, the United Methodist Church, claimed uh, segre uh, Jackson segre segregationist mayor Alan Thompson and several leaders of the Jackson Citizens Council as prominent members in good standing. Convinced that defending segregation in public institutions at the local level depended on ensuring segregation in Jackson's churches, Thompson led the city council to pass an ordinance in 1963 that made, quote, disturbing divine worship, end quote, an offense punishable by a fine of up to $500 and up to six months in prison. He then instructed the police department uh, that any attempt by an African-American to worship at a white church qualified as a vi violation of this ordinance, even if the person was there peacefully or present at the invitation of a white member. The ordinance was enforced so aggressively that in several cases, not only African-American worshipers, but white members of the church who invited them were literally dragged from the, perch, the church pews or steps, arrested, and jailed. The integration of churches was seen by both civil rights activists and segregationists as the linchpin holding the entire Jim Crow project together. In the wake of the 1954 Brown decision, with many national Protestant denominational offices approving of the ruling, the Mississippi legislature moved quickly to protect the ability of local white churches to oppose their national offices and remain segregated while still retaining their property. One of the authors of what became known as, quote, the church property bill explicitly argued that such a step was crucial because he asserted, if integration came to Mississippi, quote, it will enter through the front door of the churches. On this point, segregationists and civil rights activists agreed. On Sunday, June the 9th, 1963, an integrated group of four local students organized by Megger Evers and Reverend Edwin King, a white chaplain at Tougaloo College, attempted to cross the color line at both First Baptist Church and Galloway Memorial Methodist Church, the home congregations of the governor and the mayor um, uh, explicitly. Evers drove the students, uh, respectively, Evers drove the students to First Baptist Church himself. As the students attempted to enter, they were met by the head deacon. Using language clearly designed to establish the basis for the arrest, the deacon told the students, quote, in view of the tension present today, I believe your presence would disrupt the worship of all our people, end quote. According to the media reports, the governor arrived for worship during this confrontation, but bypassed it and entered the church through a side door. Finding themselves barred from the largest Baptist church in the state, the students walked one block to Galloway, the, the largest Mississippi Methodist church, where ushers also refused to allow them enter. But here, things took a different turn. While the segregationist mayor had plenty of like-minded people uh, company at Galloway, the church's senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. W.B. Selah, had made his position clear to his congregation, preaching, quote, there can be no color bar in the Christian church, end quote. After being informed in the middle of the service that Galloway's ushers had turned away the integrated group of students, Reverend Selah rose to the pulpit. After delivering a shortened sermon on the spirit of Christ, he pulled out a prepared statement, one he had been keeping with him for weeks uh, in the event uh, that black worshipers were turned away, and tendered his resignation. The Reverend Jerry Furr, the associate minister, followed suit. In stark contrast, First Baptist Church moved to harden its position. Meeting the same afternoon, the board of deacons put forward a resolution endorsing the church's actions, which passed without a dissenting vote. The resolution was unambiguous, stating that the church would, quote, confine its assemblies and fellowship to those other than the Negro race, end quote. Galloway lost its leading ministers, 
but it retained its closed church segregationist policy for three more years, repealing them um, only in 1966, which resulted actually in a church split which, uh, in which approximately half of its members left. So the attempt to integrate the largest white Baptist and Methodist churches in the state um, is, is not often noted, but this is the last action uh, that Medgar Evers would oversee. And the historical accounts of Evers' work and his assassination have understated the importance of church integration, not only in his strategy, but in motivations for his murder. Just two days after these white churches turned away black worshipers, he and Reverend King held a sparsely attended meeting in the black New Jerusalem Baptist Church to discuss the weekend's activities and to plan the future of the movement. While Evers realized that most of the people in the pews opposed integration, he had been deeply moved by the resignation of Galloway's ministers. He told Reverend King, what they said, what they did, refusing to preach in a segregated church. Now that's made me feel better than anything in this whole movement in many days. King told him he would pass the sentiments on to Sella and Fur, and then said these last words he would say to his friend. See you at the office tomorrow, Megger. Good night. Ever stayed on at the church to finish some work before heading home to his wife and three young children. As Evers got out of his car after midnight, a gunman shot and killed him in the driveway. The murder weapon, including fresh fingerprint on the rifle scope, was found in a field nearby and traced to Byron de la Beckwith, Jr., a member of the White Citizens Council in Greenwood. And this much of the story is, is pretty widely known, uh, but what's uh, not often mentioned is that de la Beckwith was an active member of the Greenwood Episcopal Church of the, of the Nativity. He was actually quite well known across the Delta um, for his published letters to the editor that regularly mixed Christianity and white supremacy with passages like this, <coughs> quote, I shall oppose any person, place, or thing that opposes segregation, and further, when I die, I will be buried in a segregated cemetery. When you get to heaven, you will find me in that part that has a sign saying, four whites only. And if I go to Hades, I'm going to raise hell all over Hades until I get to the white section. For the next 15 years, we here in Mississippi are going to have to do a lot of shooting to protect our wives, children, and ourselves from bad niggers." End quote. Just two years before murdering Evers, when Beckwith heard rumors that a black visitor might try to attend his own church in Greenwood, he had arrived early and stood on the steps with a pistol, declaring to his fellow members that he would handle things. At Beckwith's first trial for Evers' murder, the official state sovereignty commission illegally investigated potential jurors to help his defense attorneys weed out Jews and blacks, and Governor Ross Barnett personally appeared in the courtroom, shaking hands with Beckwith in full view of the jury. Two successive trials and all white juries failed to reach a decision, and Beckwith was not brought to justice until a third trial finally convicted him, as we all know, uh, in 1994. Now, I'm going to move a little bit here from history to today um, as I close. Um, first of all, you know, I think this neglected history is, is notable, that it's been something that has been hard for people to see. Um, even at the time, uh, Eudora Welty, for example, um, wrote a piece. She was so shaken by Evers' death. She wrote a piece called Where is the Voice Coming From?, where she attempted to um, kind of get inside the head of the killer who would assassinate uh, someone like Medgar Evers. But what's notable about this is that she did not place the gun in the hands of someone uh, as a good, upstanding Christian member of the church. She did not place this uh, in the hand, as, as Beckwith was, uh, in the upper class, uh, educated um, white Mississippians, uh, and, and pillars of the community uh, kind of crowd. This is, and this is where Beckwith's family uh, was considered in Greenwood. Uh, rather, she placed, him in a, uh, placed that voice in the head and, and placed that rifle in the hands of a, a lower class, uh, fairly uneducated, um, disgruntled uh, a white person. Uh, and, and I think that's notable, right? That, um, that, he, that even someone as insightful as Eudora Welty would have trouble sort of seeing this coming out of someone who is steeped in Christianity and steeped in white supremacy all at the same time. So uh, I'm primarily not a historian, I'm primarily a sociologist. Um, and, and so seeing the handoff between history and sociology and where this impacts us today is part of what the, the journey that the book uh, that the book takes. And I wanna um, just trace out some of those steps um, in closing to see, so where does this history leave us today, this intertwining between white Christianity uh, and white supremacy? 
Um, and uh, one, one, uh, group, one book that I drew on in writing my own book is a book called Deep Roots, How Slavery Still Shapes Southern Politics uh, by political scientists Avadit Akaria, Matthew Blackwell, and Maya Sen. And they demonstrate something that's quite remarkable, actually, um, that the enduring impact of slavery on how, uh, uh, that there is an enduring impact of slavery on how contemporary white people think, feel, and act uh, today. So they, they do a, um, a very rigorous statistical analysis looking at county level slave ownership from the 1860 census and then correlate that with public opinion uh, 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 today. And they find that whites residing in areas that had the highest levels of slavery in 1860 demonstrate significantly different attitudes today than whites who reside in areas that had lower historical levels of slavery. So specifically, they find um, whites uh, living in these areas that had the highest levels of slavery in 1860 uh, have three attributes. They are more likely to be politically conservative and lean toward the Republican Party. Uh, two, they are more opposed to affirmative action. And three, they score higher on questions measuring racial resentment. Even after accounting for a whole range of other explanations and possible intervening variables, Akari and his colleagues conclude that, quote, present day regional differences are the direct downstream consequences of the slave holding history of these areas. And in my own book, I find something very similar. Um, and one of the ways I, I look at is a contemporary public opinion and looking at a broad set of questions, in fact, 15 different questions um, that I combined into something I call the racism index. And these questions really cover a lot of ground. They're designed to get a broad sense of um, a respondent's attitudes toward race and particularly structural, uh, structural injustice and structural racism. So they cover a lot of ground, four specific areas. They cover attitudes about Confederate symbols, um, attitudes about African-American economic mobility and limits to that economic mobility, the treatment of African-Americans in the criminal justice system, and the general perceptions of race, racism, and racial discrimination. And what I find is, even when I control for a whole range of other factors like partisanship, education levels, region, what I find, generally speaking, is that uh, white Christians score higher on this uh, racism index uh, than do whites who are religiously unaffiliated. And that's true across the questions and it's true of these questions uh, combined. Um, and it's also notable that this is not just a white evangelical problem here. I've been talking about the South, but one of the things the book points out is that uh, this history actually permeates both white mainline Protestants that are actually more prevalent in the uh, Midwest and white Catholics that are more prevalent um, in the Northeast. And uh, to summarize a couple of the other findings, I find that being affiliated today with a white Christian group is independently um, associated with an approximately 10% increase in holding racist attitudes, um, and that actually attending church uh, is largely uh, does not mitigate uh, uh, these findings. So in, in other words, uh, attending church does not make white Christians uh, less racist, and in, in fact, in the case of white evangelical Protestants, uh, the data uh, finds uh, or the data shows that the relationship between holding racist attitudes, more racist attitudes, and white Christian identity is actually stronger among those who attend church more frequently than less. So where does this leave us? Um, I, I think it leaves us, um, you know, thinking about history and its implications uh, for today, um, <clears throat> and and some of the things that are going on uh, uh, just right out of the headlines. So symbols of white supremacy, for example, are falling all around us. In addition to Confederate monuments, places like Richmond, um, uh, the former capital of the Confederacy, uh, uh, here in uh, you know our home state of Mississippi, uh, most recently the Mississippi flag has been uh, the the Confederate symbol has been voted out of uh, the Mississippi state flag, and that flag has now been moved from flying over our civic buildings uh, to being housed in the building uh, that is hosting this talk. Uh, today the, in, in the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, where it can be viewed as part of the state's struggle uh, toward civil rights. But, you know, we Southerners know that the importance of history for our current moment. One of my favorite quotes from William Faulkner uh, captures this. He famously wrote, the past is never dead. It isn't even past. <laughs> so my hope is that even amid this progress, um, we'll realize and recognize that this is true for us now, that our past is not yet past. And it won't be until we summon the will to face and dismantle a theology and a worldview that legitimize those monuments and those symbols to white supremacy and then move on to the more creative 
and the much more demanding work of cultivating something worth leaving in its place. Thank you. Hi, Robbie. Thank you so much for those, uh, wh what you just gave us. I, ha I had all these great questions for you, and now the notes I just took, I feel like I have a whole new set. So I'll try not to mon uh, uh, monopolize this conversation because I know we have some people who have questions for you online. The, w the way I look at your book, uh, the way it's set up, you, chapters 1 through 5 present the problem. And then chapter six through seven kind of provide some examples of uh, progress or, or ways that we might be able to uh, alleviate the problem or work towards that process. Uh, but the problem, the way I understand it, uh, is that white Christianity equals white superiority or white Christianity equals racism. And uh, statistically speaking, uh, from, from the work you did. Now, that is a bold statement, but it, it, the, way, the way you structure it, it's not so much that you're making that statement. It's, this is what you found based on the research that you did. Uh, so at some level, the, the question has to be asked, how does Christianity authorize, or how does white Christianity authorize white superiority and racism. And I think, uh, you know, this, this is certainly a question before uh, your presentation, but uh, how does that function, not just during the Ross Barnett First Baptist Church period, but today? How does it continue to uh, reaffirm uh, white superiority from a cultural standpoint? Great. Well, thanks, Jason. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's, you know, the, the reaction, I think, sometimes when I'm having conversations about what I found in, in the, not only the historical research, but the social science research, you know, for many people, particularly who, you know, are, uh, uh, think of themselves as good upstanding Christian people are, is kind of a dismay, like, how can this be, um, you know, kind of question. Um, and, you know, one of the things, and I, I think I had a little bit of that even myself when I sort of first started seeing and really paying attention to these patterns in the data, which were just there year over year, question over question, survey over survey. So it wasn't just like one survey that found this. I mean, this is a consistent pattern um, over over time. Um, and so, you know, but, I, but I, I think if you go back to the very beginning and you sort of ask yourself, okay, so what was the crucible that really created uh, American Christianity, and and particularly since we're you know in the South and um, particularly Southern, um, you know white evangelicalism, um, you know, and that that if you imagine what it looked like, it often looked like this, um, and and so in the book I, I treat um, uh, I, I talk about first the First Baptist Church of Macon, Georgia, which is the progenitor of my parents' uh, church. That church was founded in the 1820s, um, uh, well before the Civil War. And it was pretty typical, I think, of the churches that existed at that time. And it looked like this. It looked like white slave owners um, often bringing enslaved people to church with them, right? And the church roles included both white slave owners and then a section for enslaved people in the official church roles. And if you think about architecturally um, how that got built in, um, you know, whites would sit up front. African Americans would sit in the back or in specially constructed balconies, um, right, for enslaved people in the back. And if you think about that as the seedbed of early American Christianity and, and white Christianity, and then you ask yourself, so what kind of sermons could be preached in an environment like that? What kind of uh, what, what passages of scripture could be read? Um, what sort of prayers could be prayed? What kind of rituals uh, could be formed? Um, you know, how was communion? Uh, served and you know, and you realize that okay, so it's going to be very light on themes like Exodus, liberation, uh, the prophetic tradition of Amos and Hosea of let justice roll down like mighty waters and righteousness uh, like a mighty stream. Like the, you know, um, those are not themes you're going to hear. You're going to hear um, slaves obey your masters, right? Um, and and things like people being content with their place in a very otherworldly otherworldly religion uh, that uh, makes light, uh, really, of current injustices uh, because they'll all be corrected in the by and by. Um, and this kind of highly individualized uh, theology, um, really, that is about a personal relationship with Jesus 
um, and, and this very intimate individualism uh, that it, the beginning and the end, really, of authentic Christianity is whether you have a personal relationship with Jesus. But that screens out, um, you know, social justice. It screens out responsibility. Um, and it, and it, it really is the cause of um, this, you know, line that has haunted me from Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, yeah. where he looked at white Christian churches mm-hmm. and he talked about the anesthetizing effect of their stained glass windows, right, on the social consciences of white Christians. And so if you think about that as the crucible in which American theology and practice and lived religion on the ground was formed, that question, how can this be, I think very easily uh, becomes, well, how could it be otherwise? Thank you. I, and, and this it kind of brings me to my, my next question about the, the, the term white uh, in general. Uh, some people who are white don't like the term. They don't think of themselves as white. They think of themselves as, you know, so, you know, some other kind of human identifier. But they don't like the term white. If they talk about race and whiteness, they talk about Caucasian. It's it's an unsettling term for for a lot of people, um, it, which kind of it begs a whole new set of questions. You use the term both in your first book, The End of White Christian America, and now. Uh, this this new book that I don't know is based on a quote by James Baldwin, but uh, white too long uh, for for that group of people who don't like the term, kind of shy away from white and whiteness uh, in general. Uh, you know, how, how does this book? Yeah, you know, how would they respond to this? Do you think? And and the the other question that comes with that. When you're working on a book like this, you, you certainly have an audience in mind. Uh, but will will white America listen to you, or uh, will your you know, or is this going to be an echo chamber speaking to, to to folks who already believe the same thing and saying yes to you? Uh, but that really doesn't change anything. So, what about the folks who are either unsettled by the term white? Or the folks who are white supremacists, uh, either actively or passively, and and just kind of want to stay away from it. So maybe those are two different kind of questions uh, about how white functions in our society. But I'd love for you to kind of respond to that. Yeah, no, I mean, these are, look, these are difficult conversations. Um, And one of the reasons why I made the decision to write the book um, in such a personal way, um, I think, is... Uh, because, you know, I, I've had my own journey um, on, on these on these questions. And so it really was about, I think, trying to write a book. Uh, so, I, you know, the, the first uh, sentence of the book has the word I in it. The last sentence of the book has the word us um, in it. And very much trying to say, look, this is not a finger wagging book. I mean, this is yeah. this is a book where I'm really trying to kind of talk about my own journey with this. You know, and the first thing I would say is that uh, our, our challenge, you know, my fellow white Christians uh, to do is to just try to sit with the discomfort a little bit. Um, I think that that um, push off of not wanting to talk about whiteness or rejecting it out of hand is, I think, a move ultimately out of discomfort and worry about where that conversation is going to lead, right? Um, and so I think having some courage, right? It really takes some courage um, to sit with this discomfort and think about um, kind of what that conversation is. And even the term white supremacy, you know, I think that term is often taken to be about, you know, the KKK and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, people in pointy hats and and people who are, um, you know, uh, lynching people. And, but I don't mean that at all. I I think the real challenge and and white supremacy is often a word. I think that people um, kind of recoil uh, from uh, taking seriously, but if we just flip the words around, even instead of white supremacy, um, a belief in the supremacy of whites. And we think about it less as personal prejudice, um, but more about um, a commitment to setting up society in a certain kind of way um, that has um, really um, valued the lives um, of white people and provided more opportunities for white people than for black people. Um, Then I think there's no doubt, right, Mm -hmm. that, uh, that white Christianity has been wrapped up with that project from the beginning of the country. There's no honest way of reading history um, without realizing that today. And again, I think the, the question is, so if we have jettisoned um, the, you know, outright uh, reject, if we, have, if we have rejected outright racism, if we have re- rejected slavery, if we rejected uh, Jim Crow segregation, um, but we haven't interrogated 
the theology that justified and built that worldview, Perpetual. then certainly the work hasn't hasn't yet really um, you know gotten done. Thank you. And uh, I don't know how many more questions I'm going to get to ask you, so I'm going to ask a, a personal question, and it looks like this will be my last question for you. Uh, the critical race scholar, Thandaka, wrote a book several years ago called Learning to be White. Uh, and, and in this book, she asked her white colleagues, when did they learn that they were white? And uh, th their first reaction is like, well, we've always been white. Uh, but but then she pressed them because whiteness and race in general is a social construct. So it has to be constructed in the psyche. And uh, when pressed... She wrote story after story of people telling some kind of inhumane, terrible experience they had as a kid, usually with a parent or a grandparent, about what it meant to be white, what you can't do, what you are supposed to do, who you can associate, associate with, who you can't associate with. And so there is this real disconnection with being a, an authentic human being uh, in, in white identity. Uh, and you talk about this book as a, uh, a memoir of sorts. Uh, so those things, uh, I'm looking at that intersection for you. When, when did this become an important part of your scholarship to kind of dissect and deconstruct whiteness within Christianity, uh, that, that kind of personal story uh, that led you to this? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's been a long, long journey. I mean, I, I, but, you know, I think it really didn't begin in earnest until my, my 20s when I was in seminary, and I realized the origin story of the Southern Baptist Convention, right, that it was actually formed, um, you know, on the issue of slavery in 1845 to allow a slaveholding missionary to be sent out um, and supported uh, by the convention. And they you know, formed their own convention because Northern Baptists wouldn't uh, get behind a slave owning, uh, sending out a slave-owning missionary. So, Realizing that, that was the origin story of my faith, of my particular uh, denomination and, and its expression of Christianity, I think was a, a moment of awakening. Uh, obviously, I'm in my uh, you know, early 50s, so that's, that's been now 30 years ago. Um, and uh, it's been, a, I think, a gradual, gradual awakening. But even for this book, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I spent some time at the beginning of the writing process um, a little more than two years ago um, just trying to sit down and journal a bit about where I was aware of whiteness and race erupting into my consciousness. And my first reaction was exactly what you're describing, was like, well, not much. Like, and that's a luxury I think people who are yeah, part okay. of the dominant culture have, right? Is yeah. that you, you just aren't aware of it. But as I sat with it, um, I could remember just one quick example. I remember the KKK demonstrating outside our soccer field. Um, but even more personally than that, because we just kind of went by, was our integrated soccer team um, in middle school not being able to have its swimming party at the Moose Lodge uh, in Jackson because it had a prohibition on African Americans coming and using the pool um, and having to, and just that, you know, blowing my mind that like our, our friends on our soccer team couldn't come and we, we ended up changing the venue. But, but you know, little moments like that um, uh, that, uh, that, that have, have sort of stayed with me. But, so I think that's sort of the beginning of it uh, for me, but it has been really an embarrassingly slow process, um, you know, looking back on it. Thank you so much for your time. I'll turn it over to general questions now. Chris? Yeah, we have questions from the online audience and some comments as well. Deirdre Payne says, uh, asks Dr. Jones, are you familiar with Dr. Carolyn DuPont's book, Mississippi Praying, in which she details this history for the years 1945 to 1975? Yours is an excellent companion to that, as well as Joe Rife's Born of Conviction. Yeah, that, that's right. No, that's a great book. Um, there's Mississippi Praying. There's Born of Conviction. There's Sanctuaries of Se Segregation, which is another book I would uh, recommend, um, all of which have done, um, you know, I'm, I'm primarily a social scientist, not a historian, so I have leaned on uh, and stood on the shoulders of um, this, this work, um, all of which are cited uh, in my book. But there's some amazing like, you know, uh, spade work that has been done to really document, um, again, this, 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 his, this period where, um, you know, this, the story still haven't really been told um, that much, but there are some great books out there that really dig into it and, and give the blow by blow, um, you know, really troubling history here. Another question. Uh, did you say that you see white Christian churches as linchpins in the battle for civil rights? 
when their membership was strongly opposed to implementing the gospel of Jesus? Uh, no, I said I saw them as, as linchpins uh, in uh, opposition to um, uh, civil rights. Uh, that, that, you know, if you look in, like the stories that I told in, in Jackson and this conviction that the segregation came, it was going to come through the front door of the churches. Um, that was the fear, I think, on the Jackson Citizens Council. It was also the, the, um, the conviction of Megar Evers and others um, that if black and white people could worship together, um, you know, this would make nonsense of uh, segregation in the schools um, and elsewhere um, in the city. But, but the record's pretty clear that, that even though we have these examples, Reverend King, um, Ed King uh, here in Jackson, and so many others who courageously stood up, uh, that the vast majority of white Christians, particularly in the South, uh, but not only in the South, uh, I, should, I should say, but the vast majority of white Christians uh, were not taking those stands, uh, which is why we got the kind of response uh, such as we did from letter from Birmingham jail with Martin Luther King, who was just utterly mystified, not, not about the, the kind of, you know, overt uh, segregationists that were throwing bricks, uh, you know, at John Lewis and, and Selma, uh, but about the more quote unquote respectable white Christian churches that just remain for the most part, utterly silent on these issues. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned that the, the Galloway church split after integration. Do you have uh, any idea how many of those church splits occurred in the state during that era and whether the majority of the new churches were the integrated or remained segregated? In other words... You know, I, I don't know. I don't have any figures on that um, around. I know it was... Um, it, I mean, what it depended on, of course, was a set of ministers uh, or, or a lead minister who was willing to take a stand. Um, and so, unfortunately, I think those were fairly few um, and far and far between. Uh, uh, so I, I think not as many as you might think, uh, but I, I don't have any direct, you know, ac actual figures on that in front of me. Cynthia Alvarez asks, I grew up in a church that was founded in 1961 in North Texas that was very racist and did nothing to hide it. As a Mexican-American growing up in that society, mm -hmm. I never thought anyone would shed a light on this dynamic. What is the best way to engage people I grew up with in this conversation about how much damage was done either to me or to our society in general? Yeah, well, it's a difficult uh, these are difficult times. They're difficult because um, it's also been wrapped up in our politics. Um, you know, so it, it's political partisanship, it's religion, um, and we're in one of the most polarized, uh, certainly the most polarized uh, time uh, in my lifetime. So, but, you know, one of the things I found um, is telling personal stories, I think, is, uh, and telling your story, um, I think, is one of the best ways to have these difficult conversations. Then it's not about ideology. It's not about politics. It's about experience. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, it's, and it's also a, a com communally bound experience um, where you're talking with people who you shared community with on the ground and shared a, a, an experience and helping them to see, I think, um, the experience from the other side, I think, and, and um, you know, really, really to empathy. Um, and I, I, what I'm hoping is that uh, you know, the majority of white Christians will find um, and, 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 I don't know, sharpen uh, their senses of humility and empathy um, as, as a way of kind of really telling, you know, telling the truth. I, I, I wrote a piece for Sojourners a, a week ago about why I wrote the book, and um, there was a kind of youth choir anthem that comes right out of a, a New Testament verse, um, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Um, I do think there's a lot at stake, actually, for white Christians in telling the truth. Uh, about our history um, and uh, in order to live more faithfully in the present. And so in many ways, you know, helping that conversation to happen really isn't a threat, um, although it may feel like that. It, it's ultimately um, a service. One last question. This from Reverend C.J. Rhodes here in Jackson. Does your work look into how churches like First Baptist and Galloway compared to their peer black churches like Mount Helm Baptist Church and Central UMC in access to political and cultural power? You know, it, it doesn't explicitly do that. Um, you know, th this book is primarily focused on um, on white Christian uh, churches, uh, mostly because I feel like the, the other, you know, story is, is, is certainly told. I mean, I, I do talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, the difficulty, a, a little bit of, of difficulty of African-American leaders getting access to the city council, getting access to the mayor's office, 
um, you know, in, during those days, which I think very different. Um, whereas, uh, you know, the mayor was sitting um, at, at Galloway uh, Church and in kind of natural conversations with other, other white leaders. But there was clearly, um, again, I think the way that the church is served is kind of hubs and, and kind of facilitated political power in a way that black churches and black leaders were kind of um, uh, kept out of is, is certainly an important part of the story. We have come to the top of another hour. Thank you all for being with us virtually and uh, in the room as well. Uh, a few notes. There are signed copies of Robbie's new book that are available through the Mississippi Museum Store. There's information uh, on how to contact them in the live stream comments, or you can call or email the Mississippi Museum Store here at the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Uh, a special thank you as well this week to Eric Watkins and Josh Watson who helped us pull off the technical feat of uh, live streaming this sort of across the, the uh, continent. Um, thank you for Robbie Jones. Thank you as well, Jason Coker, for being with us. I hope that we see you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you.